Light shines in the darkness, and darkness has yet to overcome it. To everyone that has been touched by an toxic leader, and you know who I'm talking to, you are the light that has overcome it. You are the true heroes, right? You have flipped the switch. And we can only make a change if we are prepared to flip that switch. So thank you for being here tonight. I'd appreciate that. So my topic is arsenic in the boardroom, strategies to deal with toxic leaders. Now, we need effective leaders in order to grow communities, countries, and organizations. But the sad reality is that there's a growing prevalence of toxic leaders. Feltzman has done studies, and he estimates that between 20 to 60% of leaders are toxic. Right? So toxic leaders come across initially as charming, as pers um, persuasive. They come across in achieving organizational objectives, but that's only in the short term. In the long term, they, it's a devastating effect on the organization's brand and on the, and the individuals in the organization. So if I ask you to think of a toxic leader, who comes to mind? The DVC mentioned a few names there earlier. But toxic leaders have been portrayed in history from the pharaohs of ancient Egypt to the leaders of Rome to the Hitler, Stalin, Favut, and more lately, we have Trump and Zuma that had certain toxic characteristics. Toxic leaders are not limited to the public sphere, though. We find them in organizations, and those of us that have been exposed to it are painfully aware of the impact they have on the morale on, and how they contaminate the organization. Add to this, Bloomberg in 2016 did a study, and we are the second most stressed country in the world. Right. So yeah, you've got stress in the organization, and you've got stress as a country. Now, Kim asked me on Friday, so who is the most stressed country? Right? We are less than a percentage point behind Nigeria. So we are nearly world champs in something. Right? <laughs> So it's important to stop the organization from failing. It's important to look at certain strategies. It's important to deal with toxic leaders so that we don't have this dysfunctional organization. Right, so tonight we're going to look at the concepts of toxic leaders. We're going to look at what causes them to behave in that way. And we're going to look at some strategies to minimize and prevent it. But before we get to that, let's look at what the word toxic actually means. Toxic is the Greek word for toxicon, which means arrow poison, which implies the in intent to kill in a targeted way. So it has the intent to harm individuals. Right. So that's how dangerous toxic leaders can be. So for that purpose, toxic leadership, what's the definition there? It's an ongoing, deliberate, intentional action of a leader to undermine the sense of dignity, the self-worth, and efficacy of an individual. The cumulative effect of that is a toxic organization, where you will have the psychosocial and spiritual well-being of its members that is harmed in a almost permanent way. So we have a toxic triangle because toxic leaders don't operate in a vacuum. They are allowed to operate, right? So just as a fire needs oxygen to burn, toxic leaders need an environment and they need followers to be successful. I will discuss the toxic triangle in a little um, more detail but we'll first want to go into a little bit more about the leader. Don't ever confuse toxic leader with competence. Many people believe that leadership competence and leadership ethics is linked to that type of leadership style. 
Leaders displaying toxic characteristics come across extremely competent, as I said earlier, but in the short term. Right? Because they have the attitude of perform at all costs, they make short-term gains. But in the long run, when you need people to help sustain the organization, they don't have it. The danger of a toxic leader is that they are perceived as role models for emerging leaders. So emerging leaders look at the toxic leader and say, wow, so this person, can get pro this person gets promotion, this person's successful in organization, so maybe I should emulate their style. And it's not the role model that emerging leaders, leaders actually need. All right? When it comes to toxic leaders, it's sometimes not the what that's important, but it's also the how that's important. So we have to start asking the question, when we perform at all costs, how are we making that achievement? Right? The other angle to this is that a toxic leader could be toxic because they're actually incompetent. Right? They're put in a position of power and they're unable to deal with the pressures of the job. And the knee-jerk reaction is to then dehumanize individuals. When we talk about incompetence, we have to talk about the Dunning-Kruger effect, right? The Dunning-Kruger eff effect is basically where incompetent leaders believe they are actually amazing. <laughs> they don't realize that they are incompetent. So that blind spot is huge. The reverse to the Dunning-Kruger effect is that competent people actually believe that they have a lot more to learn. So remember this Dunning-Kruger effect because we're going to be looking at it and dealing with it a little later in the presentation. So if understanding the concept of toxic leaders, it's important to consider the work of Hogan where he says you have a dark side of leadership. You have the dark and light side of leadership. So you'll have typically when the leader knows they've been watched, when they're on the stage, they will behave in a certain way and that confidence will then sometimes become arrogance when they're not worried if they're on the stage or not, or they don't care how they're being perceived. Persuasion will become manipulation, and passion becomes emotional volatility. So we have two sides of a coin, and if we look at the work of Lominger, Lominger says that any competency can be dysfunctional when it's overused. Right, so we have the light side and the dark side of the leader. So when the leader knows they've been watched, they behave in a certain way. And when they don't care if they've been watched, they behave in another way, in a more toxic way. But then we also have different types of toxic leaders. See if you can recognize any. We have the cold fish, right? For this leader, the end justifies the means. And all concern for facts and impartiality is ignored. All decisions and actions are justified because I've achieved the end result. So I've achieved it, don't worry about how I did it. Right? Then we have the snake. These leaders believe the organization exists for their own good and for their own needs, where it is greed, status, or power. We have the puppet master. Oh no, sorry, he's the glory seeker. Okay, the glory seeker. Seeking personal glory, regardless of who helped achieve that glory, will take the recognition for it, regardless if they made any meaningful contribution to that. The puppet master wants to maintain control, absolute centralized control over everything and every decision. And then we have the monarch. This leader will rule the organization as if it's their own kingdom. Right? All assets in the organization is for their use. News 24, a few weeks ago, reported on a previous DVC of ours that is using her new institution as her own fiefdom. Their words, not mine. A monarch, a toxic leader, you decide. 
So what are the characteristics of toxic leaders? Now, while charismatic leaders are not necessarily toxic, most toxic leaders are charismatic. They use that skill to manipulate people, to create support amongst vulnerable followers, right? Um, by creating a world and a vision of threats and insecurities, right? And they perceive rivals in everywhere they go. So they will identify com competitors, they'll identify people that don't support the agenda, and um, they'll use that charisma to get people on their side. And then we have the ones that are overly self-centered and egotistical, and we have those that have a personal need for power, relinking back to the type of leaders that we looked at earlier. And then we also have the ones that actually have a bit of hate in them that comes probably from when their childhood and trauma in their childhood. And biographies on Stalin and Hitler um, ex explain that story, that they have a specific hate for individuals and it's based on childhood trauma. So how do toxic leaders behave? When they're wrong, they deny. Didn't happen. When the evidence is presented, they will defend and they will rationalize. They will rewrite that narrative. They will tell the story or try and tell the story in their own terms. They try to control that story. When they're confronted with facts that won't go away, they will try and cut the person at the knees. They brought it up. They'll dehumanize that individual. And then they'll try to destroy the reputation or the career of the person that brought that up. So, toxic triangle, we have our leaders, we have our different types of leaders, but we also have the leaders need followers. And we have two types of followers. We have the conformers. We have those individuals which is, they have unmet needs, they have a low self sense of self-worth, they have an external locus con of control, and they're easily manipulated. The toxic leader needs that type of grouping to achieve the agenda. And then we have the colluders. The colluders are that small mass of people that are behind the toxic leader. They give the toxic leader the power, all right, because they have their own agenda. We see this in South Africa. We've seen it in South Africa with late night meetings, um, with reshuffling of cabinets, when um, you had the attempt of state capture. That was done all behind closed doors. Now, we have a perfect storm about to happen in our, in our country. We have a mass of people who have unmet needs, who are still in, uh, living in a lot of poverty that have an external locus of control, that are easily manipulated. And then we have these colluders in the background with their own agendas. So it's a perfect time for a new leader, a new toxic leader, to stand up. Perhaps one wearing a red beret? So what are the signs of a toxic culture? because you have your leaders that are toxic, you have the followers that are needed there, but then you have an environment that needs to be conducive to a toxic culture. Don't misunderstand but the first two bullets. The first one is the weak leadership that allows that toxic leader to happen in the organization, to act in the organization. Those are the leaders that create the power behind this individual to say everything's okay, carry on. And then you have the bullying type of leader, because I don't believe a toxic leader and a bullying leader is there any difference. And those are the people that have done research on bullies and about to do presentations on bullies, you know what I'm talking about, right? It's, it's a form of toxicity. It's another t um, sign of a toxic culture is a lack of transparency and morality, dishonesty, corruption, a reluctance to embrace change. So these environments can become very toxic if you have these signs in, this organi in your organization. So what are some of the typical characteristics of a conducive environment? First of all, a toxic leader loves an unstable environment. Right? And we're an unstable environment as a country. Economic volatility, 
we, um, there's uncertainty in our world. They, and, this, and your country and your, and your organization is looking for this turnaround artist, the guy or the person that will come in and say, I'll save the day. Right? The problem is they come in, they make short-term gains, and they leave. And they leave an organization and a country that is hurting and that needs some form of healing. And the poor person that takes over is then having to try and save the sinking ship. We also have the perceived threats. Reason why we have to build a wall between two countries is because we fear immigrants, we fear job losses, right? So they will play on these perceived threats because you have this group of um, vulnerable people that will buy into that because they are vulnerable. You also then have the cultural values. And cultural values is the message that gets sent in the organization as to what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. Right? We, the, if you have a culture of let's win at all costs, that could lead to ball tampering, as we saw with the Australian cricket team. So you had a winning culture turn toxic because it was win at all costs. When it comes to stakeholder demands, stakeholders are demanding on an increasing basis and people then have, we have to achieve whatever the stakeholder demands. We saw that with Enron. And with Enron, they had a performance management system that sent the message to people in the organization, achieve what we can and it doesn't matter how you do it. Right? Their performance management system was commonly called the rank and yank system, which basically meant every year after performance management, 10%, the bottom 10% of the employees would be fired. Understand that Enron employed graduates from Ivy League schools. So they were getting the cream of the crop, but they were ranking people and the bottom 10% would be fired. So what message has been sent to employees in the organization? I have to do whatever I can to keep my job. So we have to be careful in organizations as to the message we send. Every single decision taken in an organization is a communication to the employees in the organization. So this is all doom and gloom. However, how do we protect our organization? A study done by Duke University said 91% of the respondents who were CEOs and CFOs said that culture is critical to organizational success. I want to repeat that because it wasn't HR people that said that. It was the CEOs and the CFOs that have come to the realization that the culture in our organization will make us successful or not successful. So it's time, I believe, for a different leader. And that's why I've chosen this topic. Right? It's time to look at solving the organizational issues in terms of toxic leaders by putting strategies in place so that we can protect our organization. So how do we go about doing this? We have to make sure our recruitment and selection processes are rigorous. We have to select our panelists better. Right? But before I go there, let me just highlight one thing. Toxic leaders use the back door to get into the organization. And if they don't use the back door, they use the back door for their friends once they're in the organization. So they want to surround themselves with people that support their agenda. So the best way to do that is support people who think like me that want to achieve what I want to achieve. So they will use that agenda to replace people in organizations that don't think like them. Or they will try and dehumanize them. Right? So it's important that we select our panelists really well. In organizations, in sports arenas, in the world, we have A players, we have B players, and we have C players. 
A players are your top performers, right? C players are possibly the marginally incompetent or marginally competent and the incompetents. Why do we include C players on our selection panels? How do we expect C players to identify leadership competence or leadership skills? So we have to relook at who we put on our panelists. We also have to train our panelists so that they are able to identify leadership competence. Right? And perhaps it's time to bring in qualified psychologists and industrial psychologists as part of that panel. Or we also need to make sure that we don't rely too much on the interview because toxic leaders are, as we said, charismatic, but they're also very seductive in an interview. They tell you what you want to hear, right? And the interview should not be the only way to select a leader in an organization. Why are we not looking at proven track records of leadership skills? Why are we employing people that are marginally competent? And please, I'm not only talking about our university, I'm talking about organizations. Because remember, Feltzman said 20 to 60% of leaders are toxic. Right? Psychometric assessments has to happen at high level <coughs> appointments because those psychometric assessments will play a role later when it comes to if we have appointed tox a toxic leader, it plays a role later in, to, in um, the coaching of that individual and identifying developmental areas. So it's important that we are very vigilant during the, uh, the selection process, and HR really needs to play a role with regards to that. So let's assume we've appointed a person that could be toxic leader. How do we go about identifying this individual early in the process of that appointment? Well, there's certain characteristics displayed by a toxic leader. The imperial behavior the person that wait, makes you wait for an appointment or does not answer an email, right? Because either they can't make the decision or it's beneath them to answer a question or an email. They also will create inner circles of marginally competent or incompetent people that will then make the decision. They will also have the ethical failure will basically be they will marginalize competent people because the competent people show them up by asking possibly relevant questions that are important to be able to do your job. Right? They're incompetent. They avoid making difficult decisions. They use cliches such as, I'm applying my mind for how long do you need to apply your mind before you make a decision, right? So they, they're unable to make that decision. And they, they also very, um, they have quite a few um, mood swings. And I'm saying that because I might not be able to pronounce that word, okay? <laughs> <laughs> that was for Bridget, okay. A toxic leader does not encourage communication. A toxic leader does not ask for feedback. Which boardroom in the world is it acceptable to tell your colleagues to shut up in a meeting? And that has happened. So those are early identifications of toxic leaders. So how do we protect the organization? We make sure that we educate employees in the organization to identify the manipulative behaviors that are present. We make sure that we try to encourage people to not conform to group norms. We provide guidelines to people on how to respond to manipulative behaviors. And we implement mechanisms for people that they can speak up without the fear of being victimized. That psychometric assessment I spoke about previously, 
the individuals in the organisation. We've appointed them because they were seductive in the interview. That psychometric assessment needs to be discussed with that individual. Not necessarily with an, by an individual that's in the organisation, but an external person. Then coaching needs to be applied so that we, they can deal with the areas that need development. But then you also need an individual to recognise that they may need some help with regards to that. So an effective performance management system, and my colleagues in the university will hate me for this, is essential. How are you ever going to manage performance if you don't have an effective performance management system? And I'm not saying it has to be linked to rewards. Sorry, Pietrus. <laughs> We also need to create a humanizing and ethical environment. And what does a humanizing environment actually mean? A humanizing environment means we need to recognize and respect and protect the dignity and rights of everyone. Right? We need a leader, we need a new type of leader. We need a leader that exhibit service towards others. We need leaders that manage for the common good rather than personal interest. We need leaders that allow democratic decision making, that will relinquish control, that encourages open communication, and celebrates cooperation. And this type of environment will become very uneasy for a toxic leader. And th they will find it very uncomfortable to stay if that's the environment that we envision for our, for our organizations. So we all have toxicity in us. Sorry for you. <laughs> we all have it in us, right? And I hope that I have, with this presentation, I'm not yet finished, but I hope that I have caused some discomfort in some of us here tonight, in terms that we're reflecting on our own behavior. Because it's done wonders for me, to ref while I was preparing this, to reflect on my own leadership style. And I'm hoping that there's enough discomfort that you actually start to reflect on your own style and the effectiveness on this. And some of the questions you can ask yourself are the following. What am I doing to keep my team on the right track in reaching objectives? Is there a vision for my team? It's not your vision. It's their vision. Is there a vision? Do you know where, or do they know where they're going? Am I communicating regularly? Or am I sitting in my office behind closed doors sending emails? Do I, do I spend time with my subordinates? What's important, do we celebrate successes? Jack Walsh said, there's three things that makes a successful manager. You need to have a vision. You need to have, celebrate successes and people need to enjoy what they do. Am I focusing on the wellness of my team? That should be the central question to every decision taken in the organization. Remember, everything we do is a communication, is a message we're sending to people in the organization. But am I concerned about the wellness of my people in my team, or am I just adding more and more and more to my employees, or on my employees? Do I have the spirit of generosity I spoke about that with, about, with Paul Poisant, that he has a spirit of generosity. But do I spend time with my people? Are you generous with your time? Not money, it's time. Are you generous with your attention? Right. People need to know that you are willing to spend time with them. People need to know, even though you are very busy, that you take time out to actually find out how they're doing. Am I open to receiving feedback from my team on my actions and behavior? And that's a little hard. But the manager that tells his team to shut up in a meeting 
is not encouraging communication. And lastly, am I creating an environment where everyone is treated with dignity and respect? So in conclusion, toxic leaders, they are brutal reality. And victims of workplace bullying know that we will either retaliate or we will withdraw. And what you need to realize is you're also not going to get support or not much support from your co-workers because they're actually quite happy that they're not the victim, number one. Or they're also too scared to do something about it in case that they do get victimized. So it's a very lonely place out there when you speak up against bullying. But there is hope that ultimately people are inherently good. And we need leaders that are courageous. We need leaders that will stand up and not tolerate the poison in our environment. But that requires leaders to have courage. It requires leaders to ensure that to do what's right for the organization, the team, and the individuals. How odd that we spend so much time treating the darkness and so little time seeking the light. The ego loves to glorify itself by self-analysis, yet we do not get rid of the darkness by hitting it with a baseball bat. We only get rid of the darkness by turning on the light. I challenge you, turn on the light. Thank you.